Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. A significant portion of Book 10 of Augustine's Confessions is focused on the faculty or power of memory, which is not something completely unique to human beings. Other animals have memory, but there is a greater range and depth to the powers of memory that we have as the kind of beings that we are that Augustine explores. And it's worth noting that at certain points he comes close to equating memory with the mind because it plays such an absolutely central Role. Now, why is he so interested in memory? Well, these are the confessions, and he's been talking about his memories and ruminations and the conclusions that he's drawn from them for, you know, nine books now. And now he's going into another book talking about uh, this incredibly important central dimension of ourselves. And he uses a lot of really interesting language. It's, you know, I'm calling it here an extensive power of the mind. That's rather abstract. He talks about the vast fields of it. It is a treasure house, you know, a, th a thesaurus, a place that you can get all sorts of things out of. And if you think about, you know, for any human being at any given point in their life, they have who knows how many different memories. Where, how do we divide them up and connect them together? You know, there are so many we couldn't possibly enumerate or even remember all of them successfully in the course of the rest of our life. And yet we take this capacity for granted. He brings up some of the powers that it has. We can call things up. He actually has some language there that's almost reminiscent of people in sci-fi movies where they've got like a, a screen that floats in the air and they push things out of the way and bring in other things. That's what we're doing all of the time without even realizing it. I say, Think about, you know, what Augustine said in book six. And you don't have to like, you know, do all processing now. You're like, here's some sort of robot or computer. It just pops into your head. Or, or you might say, oh, I haven't read Augustine's book six, but I remember Dr. Sadler's really into Augustine. Boom, there's a memory, right? So memory is, is incredibly um, powerful. And the question that we want to ask is, well, how far does it go? What can memory actually extend to? And this is where it gets really, really interesting. You know, he says, great is the power of memory, exceeding great it is, an inner chamber, vast and unbounded, who has penetrated to its very bottom? Yet it's a power of my mind, it belongs to my nature, and thus I do not comprehend all that I am. Is it the mind? Is the mind therefore too limited to possess itself, right? So, What's included? He, he tells us, think about the sense images, right? Imagine a, you know, uh, violet, the flower. And if you've ever smelled it, imagine the scent of violets. You put your nose down to it. We used to have them growing all over the place where I grew up in the spring. It was something quite nice. You could smell the fragrance. You could also pick them and turn them into bouquets. Those are all memories. Every single flower that you plucked, there is a memory stored away somewhere on that flower and the shape of its petals, the irregularities it had, the way the light came off of it. All of these sense images, Augustine says, can be there. And sometimes they can get jumbled, right? He says, 
certain things are, uh, you know, asked for and others rush forth in mobs and, you know, they can get in the way. And uh, he says, all as light and all colors and bodily shapes are coming through the eyes, varieties of sounds through the ears, odors by the portal, the nostrils, taste by the portal, the mouth, by the sense diffused throughout the whole body. What is hard, what is soft, what is cold or, uh, or hot, what is soft, smooth or sharp, heavy or light, whether inside or outside of the body, the great cave of memory. And I know not what hidden and inexpressible recesses within it takes all these things, all these things that are coming from the senses to be called up and brought forth when there is need for them. All these enter in each by its own gateway and are laid away within it. So a a good portion of what we've got are these sensory images put together in different ways. That is a very significant part of memory, but we can go further. Augustine says, I also remember the things I did. I don't just remember sort of like a camera recording. I remember doing them, right? And I remember experiencing things. He says, here we go. Um, I encounter myself and recall myself and what and when and where I did some deed and how I was affected when I did it. There are also those things which I remember either as experienced by me or as taken on trust from others. From that same abundant stock, I combine one and another of the likenesses of things, whether things actually known by experience or those believed in from those I have experienced with things past. And from them, I meditate upon future actions, events, and hopes. So memory is absolutely central not just to our remembering, you know, images and things like that, but to, you could say, our agency, our concept of ourselves as human beings. So that's already covering a lot of ground. What else does memory include? Augustine talks about the liberal arts, the, actually the precepts of the liberal arts, de doctrinis liberalis praecepta, right? So he's actually talking about the liberal doctrines, the, the doctrines that make people uh, free and, and capable of acting, uh, you know, in, in a, a free way. Um, so what are these? In his case, rhetoric has been an absolutely important one, but he learned quite a lot of things as well. And he says, um, all the things that I learned in these, which have not yet slipped away and are put back as it were into an interior place that is not a place. These things are not images that I carry about, but the things themselves, what literature is, what skill and disputation is, how many kinds of question there are, and whatever else of such subjects I know, all this is in my memory. And in such way that I have not retained the image while leaving the reality outside, I took those things into my mind. I have grammar, I have literature, I have rhetoric inside of me in my memory, not the images, but the things themselves. So this is, you know, something quite important, isn't it? And he goes on and he says, uh, in the, in, this is in chapter 10, when I hear that there are three, three kinds of questions, does a certain thing exist? What is it? What are its properties? I retain the images of the sounds out of which these words have been fashioned. I know they passed with ordered sound through the air, that they no longer exist. But as to the things themselves, which are signified by those sounds, I didn't attain to them by a bodily sense, nor did I describe them anywhere in my mind. Yet I stored them away in my memory as those things themselves. So the questions, the principles, all of these things that go into the types of knowledge that we have, at least most kinds of knowledge, because we're going to get to another important kind of knowledge in just a moment, They're stored in our memory. Then there's mathematics. Augustine will have an entirely separate chapter devoted to um, principles and laws of numbers and dimensions. This is, you know, the mathematics of the time. He says, these are not colored, nor do they give out sound or odor, nor are they tasted or touched. I've heard the sound of the words by which these are signified, but the sounds are one thing and the things are another. 
The sounds are in Greek or in Latin, but the things are neither Greek or Latin nor any kind of language. I've seen lines drawn by builders, even lines so fine as to be spiders' threads. But other lines, those of dimensions, are different. They're not images of which the eye has told me. We perceive them in ourselves. We know them. They are in our memory. We also have memory of the previous acts of our mind. A little bit later on, Augustine will talk about how even forgetting is in a certain sense in the memory. We're not going to focus on that because that's a little paradoxical. What are other acts of the mind? He says, I've heard many things that have been fallaciously argued and I retain them in memory. I know that they're actually false or fallacious because I remember that. Even if those things are false, it's not false that I have remembered them. I remember that I distinguished between those two true doctrines and the false things said against them. It's one thing that I now perceive that I make this distinction, another to remember that I often made the distinction when I thought about them. Therefore, I remember that I've understood them and I store away in memory what I now discern and understand. So all of these things, perceive, distinguish, discern, understand, these are cognitive acts of the mind. And I remember having done those, even if the things that they were about were non-existent, imaginary, false, misleading, they're still there in my memory. So if we've got cognitive acts of the mind, what about affective or emotional, or we could say desirous or volitional uh, acts of the mind, affections, as he's going to call it, of the mind? Well, he talks about that as well. The same memory contains the affections of my mind, not in that manner in which the mind itself has them at the time it experiences them, but in a different manner. And there's something paradoxical to explore here. He can say, I remember being joyful or I remember joy without that making me joyful necessarily right now, although there are plenty of cases where we might remember something we enjoyed in the past and we feel good about it, right? And so the affections of the mind, the feelings, the desires, the fears, those are things that we remember as well. So you see just what a massive scope memory is going to have. And later on in the uh, book, he's going to go on and try to think about the happy life, what it is that we all truly desire. Is that in the memory? If it is, why don't we remember it? And he's going to conclude that the happy life is in a certain sense, you know, the thing that we all seek, it is in our memory, but it has to be clarified. It has to be understood. And this is going to lead him to try to seek out whether truth itself lies in the memory and whether God himself lies within the memory. But that goes a little bit beyond the scope of these initial discussions of this incredibly powerful and you know multifaceted faculty of the human mind that is our memory, which we so easily take for granted because we use it all the time without considering what it really is and what it can do.